All right, so welcome to another interview with uh, Aaron Lemonic, right? It's Lemonic, right? That's right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Atmo Interview, and he is the uh, now World Art Director at Activision Blizzard, um, who was also my teacher back in the day at Noman School of Visual Effects. Uh, I actually want to say for the listeners that you were actually the one that got me to get art or environment art to click with me like where i started kind of like understanding how to make a decent image <laughs> back in the day like i remember uh there was a story with uh one of my classmates and i started producing better images and he was like dude what the fuck did you sell your soul to the devil or something like you used to be terrible and now you're making cool stuff i'm like i just kind of just kind of clicked fixed it i figured it out <laughs> and then they realized oh aaron lemonic is the devil yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the moral of the story. Uh, yeah, we had dinner one night, and I, I made a deal. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, That's no, cool. you kicked my butt with um, the values, right? You you told us to paint, what was it, 10 paintings a week? It's just all in values and black and white. Um, so, yeah, that stuck in my head, and that really got to click and all the tricks and techniques, the suggestions you gave me. Um so yeah, on the site, I don't know if you noticed, there's a button called black and white values yep. where you can quickly check out the values because I've that's how important values are in paintings, right? So yeah, I did notice that. Um, I want to say that was 2011, I believe when we, I think when it was I your started. first time teaching, wasn't it? That was my first time teaching. It was crazy. That was um my, my first time teaching my own class. I had been subbing in for people and I've been, I had been to other people's classes and given talks and whatever. But, um, that was my first time having my own class and truth be told, I'm not, a you know, a natural public speaker type of person. And although like you, maybe now people wouldn't know that because I had done it for so long at this point and given so many workshops and done so much public speaking. But back then I was like, kind of at a loss for how to go about setting that up and, and, um, breaking down my time, you know, filling up that entire time. Like all of it was new to me. And a friend of mine had, uh, finished, they weren't able to do their class anymore. And he asked me to, um, to take over for him. And I was just like, shit. All right. Well, <laughs> I, all right, I can't let you down, so I'll do it. But I didn't truthfully know exactly how to do that back then. So I kind of learned on the job and, I, l I have lots of ideas. I just hadn't practiced boiling it down into a format that was, you know, three hours, five hours. At a certain point, I was doing, you know, six, seven hour classes, uh, which was gnarly. But yeah. that's a separate six thing. or seven hours. Well, yeah, because I, I was doing that class at Noman. I was doing two in a row at one point. They opened up a second oh, section. Oh, okay. So I was yeah, doing, that's brutal. It wasn't seven. It was six. It was two three-hour classes with a break in between, and the break in between was like, you know, half the time was I was chatting with students and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, so it was like two, three, three-hour back-to-back classes, which was – it was good practice, to be honest. I don't I don't know what else to say. It was just really good, really good uh, <laughs> mileage. Well, I will say that you're natural because everyone loved that class. Um, Thank you, man. So I don't know who who was the guy that you replaced that was supposed to teach Cecil. Cecil oh, Kim. Okay. Yeah. The OG. Oh, well. Yeah, the good OG. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess we would have had a good teacher anyway. So, anyway, um, that's great that uh, you've been giving other talks and lectures to other places. Yeah. At this point, so I kind of went two different phases and I had uh I I do prefer teaching in person just because I like I like interacting with the people f getting some face time you know getting giving people that one-on-one -on -one attention that they that they I know that a lot of students need and want um so yeah I kind of went through different phases I had been contacted by a school called studio arts at a certain point and I taught a little bit there which is a, a less known school than Noman but it's a cool school uh with a lot of money, a uh, grant money for that companies kind of get sponsorship to send their professionals there. So I was mostly teaching professionals from the entertainment industry, from film, from games, from all kinds of different places. And that was really cool. That's cool. Um, I taught at Art Center for quite a while, um, for several years. 
um, in the entertainment. Well, you went there. You studied there, right? I did. Yeah, I did. I loved it. I loved it back then. Um, so it was it was a nostalgic experience for me to be able to be on the the hillside campus there and teach in person. Um, that was a blast. I really enjoyed that as well. Um, That's cool. And then I did a bunch of online teaching as well, everywhere. Uh-huh. Would you say that you learn the most while teaching? Like, how do you think you improve while teaching? A hundred percent, because yeah. uh, everyone has a different style, and you know, everyone teaches in a sort of different way. But for me, I like to teach in a way that is. I start with one way of explaining the content and then I like to expand out from there and and break it down in a bunch of different other ways so that no matter how people take in the information that one of the ways is going to connect and I think that's what you're you know I I I essentially what I go into it every time with what's the class that I wish I had that I never got what's the exact way that I would explain it if I were to tailor make it for how I wanted it and how I know that a lot of students would have wanted it, what would be the class that that I would design custom? But then having the flexibility to be able to explain it in a bunch of different ways forces you to evaluate your ideas down to the most basic core of the idea and, and then break it down simply. And I'm not the kind of person that works like in an assembly line like fashion. So some people have a very regimented process and, you know, in production, a lot of people, like whether someone's a 3d modeler, like a, like an environment modeler or a character sculptor or a texture artist, whatever their um, specialty is, there has to be a a, a step-by-step process and there's a pipeline. But for a concept artist, you know, to teach that type of system, there's a million different ways to go about it. So because I don't have a regimented standardized way of doing things, it forces me to, Hey, let's just have a starting point. Well, what's, what's one way of doing it. Right. So then I present one way of doing it. And all the time I explain like, yeah, this is just one way of doing it. I could teach you many other ways, which then the students immediately open up and say, Oh, well, what are the other what are the other ways to approach that? So then I get to be more ADD about it for lack of a better term. I know it's an overused uh, thing, but I like to, I like to kind of be more free form and explain that, look, not everything falls under the same umbrella of a, of a, of a system or a, or a exact step-by-step process. Sometimes you have, and, and not sometimes, almost always you have to innovate and come up with a different process for each individual problem that you have to solve. That's what's so cool about, I think, what we do is that you get to cheat a lot where in production, it's like it either the mesh either is closed and it works or it's garbage and you have to fix it. But when what, what we do, we can kind of present the best possible, every situation in the best possible light. And in doing so, you use whatever tools get you there the best. And it doesn't always need to be the same formula every time. Yep. So in a roundabout way, um, you improve by always revisiting these different ways of approaching a different problem. And then you realize like, damn, I actually be, have become way more organized and way more uh, able to freestyle when the need when, when need be, because I'm always talking about it all the time instead yep. of just me talking in my own head, which is what I do every day anyways. But <laughs> you're explaining it. You're going over it, you know? Yeah. It's, it's great. Yeah, no, the... I do, so I specialize in map painting, um, and I do some concepts and stuff, and I design as a map painting, but it's the biggest thing there is being a problem solver and using what, like, exactly what you just said, grabbing anything just to get the image done, you know? It's not a a cog in a wheel, it's not like this precise, you're going to do the same thing over and over again. It's different with every single project you get. Uh, So, yeah, that was good. Um, All right, so what... uh, how do you, I, I remember you telling me that your parents were involved in film, right? So is that how you wanted to start drawing or were you just kind of dueling as, as a kid all the time or what's the deal? It's a good memory, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, so my, both of my parents are, you know, in the creative, you know, field, you could say my dad is a musician. So my dad is a, is a percussionist who's played in, in, uh, orchestras and uh, yeah he's a he's a percussionist and through and through um and has played in 
uh, he was in the Milwaukee Symphony when he was, he didn't, we were from uh, LA, but he moved out there to be, um, he got a part playing in the Milwaukee Symphony. And then he moved back to LA to join the film industry to be like a studio musician, which he did for until the last, uh, not the last Jedi. I, I was one of the last Star Wars movies was his last, I forget which one was the one he finally hung up the gloves, but he, that was his last film up until just recently since like Apocalypse Now era, like since then he's been Sick. working on, you know, most of the films that are scored in LA and uh, among oh, awesome. other things as well. So, you know, I got to see the entertainment industry, not the visual arts side, but I got to be around some very, very talented people yeah. who understand the what's necessary to be successful in this industry and that it is very competitive and you the the your your effort needs to reflect that you know you have to leave it all out there like you pull out all the stops and you're going to be doing that as much as since from your i've been you know working on this since i was a little kid i never wanted to do anything else uh to be honest but i didn't okay so that's a side note we can go into that later but i, I didn't know i would be in this exact area of the creative arts i just knew i wanted to be an artist since i was a little okay. kid so the other half yeah. of it, my mom, my mom is a, she's a Renaissance woman entirely. She's a, you know, has been a painter. She's has run a jewelry design business, her own business since the seventies. Um, uh -huh. Then transitioned into becoming a landscape contractor. So got her contractor's license, does like these epic, you know, garden designs and, and landscaping for, you know, everything all, all the way from like small cottage houses to, you know, bigger bigger houses but um so the design aspect is it was there for her and the idea of i guess running a business was there for her so it was kind of a combination between my two parents which is what i ended up sort of being i guess so you could you could say yeah it's cool and i'm sure they're super excited that you've kind of just uh they passed on the torch in a way of creativity and to for sure yeah continue in the industry yeah no the being surrounded by um creative parents you know i'm sure that is what really stimulated everything you're being constantly seeing some kind of you know music is super creative your, your mom's doing all that stuff so that's cool um so what was the other thing you were saying the side note the that you never really wanted oh or um, that you always wanted to be the well artist, i you always... so it was very my parents kind of recognized very young that that was what you know my creativity and that i you know, had the flair for, for doing art, but they didn't really know, they didn't have the knowledge, the deep knowledge of any, like of the various industries to know exactly where I would fit in. They just knew uh -huh. like, well, I don't know what you're going to do, but you're going to probably be, I mean, it seems like you're going to probably want to be an artist and, uh, from really young age. So it was just like, you know, as a little kid, like having me in activities that were just encouraging, you know, yeah. art, like whether it be like in, you know, when some kids would go to like a sports camp for the summer, like I would have, uh, you know, lessons or go to like small, like a small little private studio and just do drawing projects, like whatever, oh, like cool, a okay. 10 year old kid, you know, would do or something yeah. like that, that was kind of, that was kind of what I did as a little kid until I got into, um, I got into graffiti art, um, when I was a teenager. So I started okay. doing graffiti art in the LA, um, graffiti Never scene. Get caught. <laughs> uh, I'm going to plead the, <laughs> plead the fifth. <laughs> on all such related questions um there was lots of activity lots of you know when you say graffiti i mean like what if you imagine what like an uh, an artist like a mural painter would do it's like that approach to it you know more of cool. like looking for walls that were mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of people working on it together like really big products uh pr projects and spending multiple days and, and that kind of stuff is what i did a lot of and that oddly enough is what led me to being in, working in games. There's an artist by the name of uh, Crayola, Greg Simpkins is his name as a, he's a fine artist and his name was Crayola at the time, the name that he went by. And I met him uh, just like painting in the Venice beach pit, which was like a place where you can legally go. It's right next to the police station. It wasn't illegal. It's just, everyone would sort of just go paint there in the middle of the yeah. day on the beach. It's just cool. And I remember seeing him, painting there and I was a fan of his work and then we got to talking and it has just turned out that he worked in um one of uh one of Activision's studios at the time he was a texture artist 
And then he was like, I showed him my work and my, you know, on my phone or whatever from my website or whatever it was. I was at art center at the time finishing up school. And he had uh, put me in touch with someone from a studio called Neversoft, which was the studio that made Tony Hawk at the time. And uh, so obviously, like, it's all about urban fashion. It's all about graffiti, like cutting edge kind of, you know, modern, you know, urban look and and all of the things that we were there doing. So it was like, oh, this is the person you, you got to take a look at this person. So he kind of put me in touch with um, with, you know, the a couple of the level designers over there. And then I. I did a test, stayed up all night for a couple nights doing an entry test. And it, it, oddly enough, I, I uh, got the job. Um, it was my last term at Art Center is when I got the job as a, as a freelancer there. Okay, and the cool. hilarious thing, people think, oh, because your dad works in film, that's how you got. Well, actually, no. Like, it, yeah. it actually, not. I trust me, I would have loved to have used some contacts if, if I had some that could have got me into, like, work on some cool movies or something. But yeah. that, to this day, that has never happened once. Um, it was because of graffiti that I got into the entertainment industry, which is just like, what? It makes no yeah, sense. Th- <laughs> Everyone's got their own unique story. It's really cool. As I've, like, interviewed people, they're just so different. Uh, everyone's got their own little life journey, right? What do you yeah. say um, the industry has changed that much since you started versus now? Like, you know, I feel like back in the day, it was very difficult to kind of figure out how to go because there was no information on the internet, right? Like how to break in, how to get a job, what to do, how to put your reel together and everything. Now there's just so much information. So what what do you think? That is a great question. I usually... Um, when I do a workshop or I do a a talk, that's usually one of the first things I bring up is like just letting the audience know like where my era, like being like the oldest year of the millennials and pretty much like until you become a gen, a gen Xer, I'm like from those of us that went to school at that time. So like me, Jared Morantz, Kang Lee, Steve Messing, Ryan Minerding, those are my classmates at Art Center. All of us that were that age going through school at that time, there was no such thing. This is hard to believe now because concept art is so big. There yeah. was no such thing as entertainment design, concept art classes. Like there was no such thing. You were either an illustrator, which meant you did landscape painting and figure drawing, or you were an industrial designer or a trans designer, designing, you know, transportation design, designing um, vehicles, designing sets for music videos, designing products like ergonomics. And there was nothing that hybridized the two that same way. So all of us had this really weird way of kind of hybridizing them ourselves uh, in school, taking classes that were designed for product design or that were designed for industrial design, and then also taking illustration classes. So the way that we all got into it was a very, um, it was a very, organic process. There was no regimented way that you learned the right skills or got the right things. And the other thing that is is uh, to segue into the other important thing that I think people should know is that everyone is upset about, you know, AI right now. And, and every time a new tool gets introduced, like just forget about AI, but every time a new tool gets introduced that tips everyone or throws everyone for a spin, um, I think back to like, well, I mean, welcome to the party. Like we've, I've had to do this like three times in my career. Like when when I started school, it was all about traditional painting. It was all about, uh, you know, figure drawing, sketching, marker sketching, developing your, your painting skills, learning a process for that. By the, literally from the time we went into school, by the time we got out, it's like, nope, that's gone now. Now you're going to learn photo bashing techniques. And there was no classes for that when we were learning. So in that five year span, four year span, everything changed. And it's like all the, remember all those things that you learned, you're not going to be doing that anymore. Now you're going to be doing this other thing. And so we had to learn fresh and there were no classes. There were no, there was very little, no one was the first to crack into it, but you had yeah. like Matt painting uh, videos from Dylan Cole and you had do so doing his thing and people that had skills that were already very deep into their industry and had to, had a knowledge of 3d already and had, and they were using things that maybe were beyond the understanding. And at that time, those tools weren't so easy to learn like how they are now. Uh, it was hard to grab onto that new material much more than it became years later. 
So then once again, now that you're getting comfortable with like, all right, I think I got this like realistic thing down. We're using photos, we're painting over it. We're in integrating things together. So it looks kind of seamless. Oh, well, guess what? Four years later, nope, you're going to be using 3D now. It's not enough to yep. do that. We need it. We need it from different angles. We need we need a more realistic look. We you know, people are starting to use, that design robots are starting to use ZBrush, even though it was miserable at that time to use ZBrush. They were. And uh, people were starting to learn, you know, oh, are you using Lightwave? Are you using Maya? Are you, like the rendering it's constant? everything was always changing. And so to me, I'm like, I mean, this is just one more of those things. It's like, well, you're just going to learn whatever you, you, you integrate the new skills, however you can, and you, you learn how to swim. And that's yeah. what those of us that were from that era that we've been doing that since literally we left school, we've been trying to like reinvent, reinvent, reinvent. And all I can say is like, just be prepared to, you know, don't freak people. Just don't freak out. Just understand what is current and never, never turn your back on foundational things that make your decision making better and make your understanding, your taste better, honestly, because you can learn whatever tool in a short amount of time, you know, like if somebody wants to learn how to use a uh, blender, I mean, it's about as it's about as spoon fed as you're ever going to get in mm -hmm. the entire world. Like it's free. There's free content, free tutorials, every single thing you want to learn how to do, someone's showing you for free. It's right on YouTube. Everyone, you can sit on your couch on your phone and look up how to apply a displacement map if that's what you want to learn that day or volumetric fog or whatever the thing is that you're trying to learn. I just, I feel like uh, it's really the best time for people to get into what we're doing. That's my honest opinion. Yeah, I remember uh, at Noman, um people or I remember this guy that was just went in there just for concept art. It's like, Oh, I'm not going to get into three. I'm like, I'm pretty sure you're going to have to start using more 3d in your artwork because that's kind of the future. He's like, no, 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 I'm not gonna do it. So it's just you, I, those same debates, you know, with the photo bashing is cheating using 3d is cheating. And it's like, okay, the prop making a prompt or using AI is cheating, but you're just, you're just going to have to do it. Right. So I, it's it's a tricky situation because like on Atmo the site I put a, a report AI button on there, and I did that for um, if you're using eighty percent AI mm. uh, because in my view I felt okay I want people to be able to get jobs right and to learn the found foundations and if you're just relying on prompts then you're not going to be able to get a job um, now in in cost in for environment artists is AI isn't really cracking into it so much characters i can see why people are freaking out because they're making some amazing characters and creatures and stuff and armor and everything um so maybe i'll lower that a little less that's a debate that i'm really open to have um with the community um to be like you can't uh i don't know maybe you can use 20 percent of whatever i'll think about it more but uh it's um it is scary you know like people can think about it. Like what really freaks me out about the AI is like, I was, I thought it was really cool at first. I was like, look at this fun toy. Like I'm, it's, it's helping me come up with ideas, new composition, you know, it's great for ideation. Um, but how fast it evolved in one year. It was like, what? <laughs> That's the freaky part. So, um, you know, people are freaking out, especially students. I can't imagine what students are feeling like now. It's just like, well, is there going to be even a job for me, especially for cosplay? For vis visual effects, make it photo real stuff. That's later on. Who knows? It could be like a year of and all of a sudden it's like you're telling it, do a pan and you have a video. You don't even have to use cameras anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, I can under it's understand why people would be scared now because they're producing some crazy stuff. You could tell when it's kind of AI um, for sure, but exactly. Yeah. That's the thing that, that's the thing where, so what are, I, I first approach this like, okay, what is every, what are you afraid of exactly? Like, are, do you think that, that, um, all concept art will become, will be AI, that AI will be like, you'll just, I mean, I know there's, it'd be foolish to say that it's not going to put some people out of work because so-and-so is like, um, they just want to fill a board with images to show yeah. someone and, and it's not really about the fine tuning of the design right it's like 
we want sketches of some ad posters, you know, so like possible compositions. So they ran an AI I think They ran like a hundred ideas and made it look like, you know, um, Drew Struzan style sketching and is, uh, you've got a hundred ideas and it's kind of looks like a pencil sketch and the, obviously let's leave hands out of it because it's going to look terrible. But other than that, you know, you just got a bunch of composition ideas. I understand why that's, you know, that's a real concern and it is kind of, it's a tough one and it's a tough debate because it is copyright infringement in a way it's taking all of our work that we've posted and that's how it's able to know how to make a sketch look like a sketch because yeah. it's taking someone's sketch and it's copying that so yeah. there is that side of it there's another side of it which is this is where you struggle is where we're all using photos we photo bash you use photos that you know you take as much as possible you use photos that you find online you paint over it you change it you alter it yeah. is that different yes of course it's different but it's not as different as um, as people think, it, I don't think it's as different as people think you're taking something else that you found and you're applying it. You're taking a photo of a, you know, of a shingles of a house and you're using that photo to like map onto the side of a, you know, or whatever, a, a photo, even like honestly, anything, anything that you use that you repurpose, you're taking something that you didn't create originally. And so that that will always be a debate and i do think there should be restrictions and there should be things it's not allowed to like just take people's art i don't think that i don't think that's proper but well no go ahead go ahead well i think i think uh it's really just going to come down to the lawsuits yeah so i like we're not going to like sure there's the 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 honor code uh with the community and everything and and respect and and all that stuff and you can kind of uh, filter them out through interviews when you're hiring and stuff, and you can tell probably if they actually know how to draw and everything. Yeah. Um, but with the the legality of it, all, if it's going to be shut down or not, because they have legal things related to music, you know. You, um, so that, I really it's out of my 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 realm. But I think it's 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 going to come down to the lawsuits that are pending right now. There's like what is a uh, stock images or something um, has two lawsuits against diffusion um stable diffusion because they grabbed all their images without their permission and that's the issue right that's the biggest issue is that they did they did all this throughout without the permission but then again you bring up the point of photo bashing and like we take images without their permission as well in a way like yeah sometimes uh like, you know you buy stock photos and everything and and, and it's all copyright uh uh you have the license and everything but a lot of times you just grab some images from google and you just take a little piece um yeah. so and you use it in a way where nobody can tell it's not it's yeah. changing it you know and an attorney like i've been at studios where lawyers talked about these things and they were saying you know they threw out a number and they said if you change it x amount it is legal and you can you know and then you're you're using your art and you're submitting it to the legal department who will then review it and they'll look at it and they'll ask you what reference you use and they'll tell you if that's okay or if that's not okay so you're at least going through a vetting process right yeah um there is a difference. AI is just stealing. That's plain and simple. Like if you tell someone, yeah. "Oh, I want to do, I want to do a sci-fi city, but in Miyazaki. I want to do Akira, but in Miyazaki style," and it's stealing every background that anyone's painted for every Miyazaki movie, and it's somehow figuring out how to what makes that DNA of that style, and then it's stealing every Akira background, and it's doing it's doing the same thing. So, it would be great if you could just opt out. If you could just say like you know, there's something that you check a box, you check when every time you upload an image online or every time you upload it to Instagram or anywhere, you just say, no, thank you. I'd like, I would not, I, I don't want to participate. And then you can never take my stuff. You can make whatever you want from everything else, but you can't use my stuff. Guess what? It's still going to be around. It's not, that's not going to kill AI. If you did that, it's still going to be doing some something. Um, it wouldn't be as good, but it would still be pretty damn good. Well, I think there's always just going to be something that's going to figure out. So I have code in the back end on Atmo to not to to prevent AI from scraping images, but I know I uh, like that they're going to have something else that will bypass that, and then something else will come and bypass the next technique and method and everything and everything. Right? So that's just yeah. what they do. <laughs> so, and yeah. it's you say that it's taking their their style and DNA. Now I throw this at you saying what about when you're 
studying an artist and you're basically using their style to create stuff. Like I had, um, I mentioned this in another interview where I was in Jeremy Rance's class and basically everyone was pumping out Jeremy Rance's style because, you know, you're still a student, you haven't found your style yet. What do you, what do you think about that? Is it because it wouldn't be, like people don't view that as copying, right? It's almost in the way the same as what AI is kind of doing. But it's just like an AI person, but it's not a person, it's AI. Yeah, I know. I know. It, that's why it is very <laughs> tricky because it's creating a new thing that didn't exist before. So it's not, it's, it's the prop. The reason why people are, I think the reason why people are upset is because it's not just observing, it's taking it and using pixels of it to, it wouldn't be able to survive without the food of your stuff directly where it's not the human brain is looking at it and, and digesting what it is and then doing their own thing, which inherently will be slightly different because it's your interpretation of it as a, as a human. And we're all, you know, different and that's what makes us great. But, um, AI is like literally using it as like the gasoline, like the fuel. It can't do what it's doing without the fuel of all these, um, photos. And, and then you get into the conversation of like likenesses, and you yeah. see little bits of where it starts to get towards a, a someone's face that you start to recognize, like a celebrity, like, oh, that looks like, that looks like uh, Halle Berry kind of, or that looks, that's starting to look like Hugh Jackman a little bit, or that's like, you, you can see little bits of, oh, for some reason it thought that someone meant, even if they didn't enter it into the prompt, it just started to lean towards that look. Yeah. And you see stuff like that, and you realize like, oh, it's just taking likenesses of, of faces then again you can say yes but concept artists will do that and they'll paint over it and they'll change it so it's the human brain doing it versus it's the machine doing it um it's a tricky one it's a tricky one i think that it wouldn't people wouldn't be nearly as freaked out if people weren't like literally being phased out by it some people yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i think the character yeah, side I mean, is definitely more threatened than the environment, environment side, side because it yeah as the environment right now yeah, as of right now, it's not good at like understanding a real space. Like it makes bigger yeah. mistakes versus uh, a character, which is one silhouette. A character is yeah. one thing. An environment yeah. is mi potentially millions so many of things, things all arranged in a way that it's trickier. But uh, they'll they'll figure out a way to figure that out too. And honestly, I don't know. All I can say is that things end up the way they're meant to be somehow. And and if if it's really meant to get taken down a peg or two. Um, then it will be. And I feel like there are, they are, they should be held, you know, to the same standards of everyone else of not being allowed to steal stuff. And, uh, that's just kind of it. But yeah, there are All some right. big upsides too, dude. Like history. Yeah, no, there is definitely, you know, I, I, I'll put in a problem. Like, man, I would not have thought of that idea. <laughs> you know, it's just like, cheese. <laughs> even just like no even i'm not even I, even like something like gigapixel ai like something that uses ai to fill in gaps or uh mid-journey out paint you know like extending a painting further or a photo further you're just like i just need to get an idea of where that would go and it can just make up the expanded part yeah and it's pretty damn good and it's <laughs> not perfect but it's pretty damn good to start with yeah i mean that's so a useful you, tool do you use it at all as a tool like that like what you were just saying no, I don't use that, but I do use Gigapixel AI. I use every day. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's Gigapixel AI is essentially like a, a way to enlarge your images to a bigger, yeah. a much bigger size. Yeah. Um. And and just do it using AI to do that. And that's, yeah. you know, back in the day, we just using finding reference photos or even photos that I take, like. You know, I take photos and there's a piece of it that I really liked of my sky. I take a lot of skies. I take a lot of trees, a lot of like, you know, in Last of Us, you know, from Naughty Dog, I got in the habit of taking a lot of a lot of the best, uh, you know, foliage and um, sky imagery that I have is mine for that I took specifically for a reason. And you can find a piece of it that's not quite big enough, you know, and you can just take that piece and enlarge it significantly and boom, now you've got a high res looking thing. I feel like that's different. That's just That's know. very different. So in VFX, they use AI tools all the time. Like they have AI one of my old students just announced their Beautify AI where they just make all these older actors young again. <laughs> yep. Um, so, and, and also with rotoing and some other 
just kind of uh, steps that you just brain dead steps that you just want to cut out, you know, speed up the workflow. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just people freak out when you see a final image when he's like, wow, you took out like a hundred steps. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's true. yeah. So let's check out your work. Uh, let me share my screen. Hmm. All right. You see my screen? Mm -hmm. Cool. So yeah, this is your profile. Sick work, obviously. Um, this is so. Why are there duplicates? I, I mean, I uploaded stuff, but then in my portfolio, there's just one of each. I don't know okay. if you're able to go to the portfolio there. That would be the easiest, probably. Then it should be all. Okay. One. So how it works is that the portfolio is just a way to organize everything you upload. So when you upload, there's there's two methods of uploading. You can upload right away and make a portfolio that you name. Uh, last of us and you just put in last of us images in there or you can just upload images and not make a portfolio uh so in the all work this is everything that has been uploaded so if you made that last of us portfolio and uploaded those images it will still come come in here mm. uh so and all you have to do is just there will be a folder in the right corner i don't have it right now because i'm viewing as this is not your profile right. and you can say make a new portfolio or uh, add it to a current portfolio you have. So you can remove and add as you go. So say like you don't have a project you worked on, you're just randomly making concept arts or doodles or something randomly. You decide, you know what, I want to organize this into something and turn it into something, right? Gotcha. You can just quickly add stuff into portfolios. And this is basically just your organized version of everything that you've uploaded. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't under, I uploaded it probably twice by accident. So uh, that's where I can go back and, and remove the duplicates. But uh, yeah, I, I planned on splitting it into different portfolios of different themes and stuff uh, once everything was uploaded there. Cool. 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 I appreciate you uh, putting your work up here. I'll show you real quick. Um, it's kind of the same thing as uh, I have a reference library ability as any anyone using the site. So if you're just finding an image here, it's the exact same kind of principle as making your portfolio. So if you just click on here, you can say make a new library or add it to a current reference library or or store or image board, whatever that you have for a project, right? I got you. Um, so if you have like, you know, you want a, a project dealing with volcanoes and you just want to look up some reference art or some get some ideas, you can search volcanoes and just add it to a volcano library or volcano thing. And then you can mm -hmm. just... Um, search it that way in your reference library over there. So let's go back to your stuff. Um, cool. And uh, the edit, I don't, did you add tags to all this stuff? I did, but I didn't go into like, it would like, there were so many, I, there were too many images. I need to go back and edit them more specifically and add more tags. I just put one generic one for them because I was just in a rush. Doing yeah, 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 I get it totally. So the, um, there's one like edit tag or edit portfolio that will just, uh, distribute all the information through all the images you do through that portfolio. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you can go into individual ones that let's say you said, um, most of the images in that portfolio are volcanoes and you say volcanoes are tags or, uh, skybox or concept art. And then you're like, well, that one image that's in that same project is just a, uh, ocean. And then, but it's still under, say, Last of Us or something. So you can go into that individual image and then just change those uh, credentials, um, tags, and just that image. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. So, uh, yeah. So you worked on Last of Us. You've worked on Uncharted. You've done a lot of freelance stuff. What are you currently doing right now? You're so you used to work um, at Naughty Dog, mm -hmm. and now you're at Activision Blizzard. Yeah. Um, so I, they they officially changed the name to Activision what? Blizzard. Who? Well, it used to be Blizzard Entertainment. Now it's Activision Blizzard. Well, they're they're they merged about you know in, in two thousand and nine or something or two thousand eight at uh, sometime around there. Um, so yeah, my uh, I'm officially I can't say much about what I'm doing, but I'm yeah, I'm under the umbrella their their central art and design uh, department. So it it's that's literally all I'm, I'm able to say about it. Um, okay. But yeah, cool. it's yeah it's a great the great thing that we're doing at the moment that's cool i've actually switched i've actually left film and tv and gone into games 
And it's just a whole different world. Uh, you've worked on a lot of TV and film. How would you compare the difference between doing concept for a film versus a game? Like the experience, like like say like an art director or a director comes to you versus what the uh, game does or the process. Well, it's very, it's similar in some ways and then it's very different in others. The biggest difference being that games are interactive. So there is no designing the shot i mean the cinematics we make cinematics which are like movies which is really fun about games because you make cinematics which is like working on a movie because you are making the shot and you can cheat things however you want just to benefit that one shot but then the uh the in-game aspect of it everything's interactive so you are really designing things from a bunch of different perspectives angles viewpoints times a day all, all things that in a movie it's all the everything is all about the shot you know the yeah. the the various different linear storytelling of that thing whereas in games i feel like things have to be designed um a little bit more depending on what it is sometimes not but sometimes a little more thoroughly because they have to be um they have to be shown in a lot of different ways and you can't hide much so the set isn't just like a you know, it's not just a, it's a physical real set because your yeah. character is, you know, virtually anyways, walking around this entire thing. Like any one of those environments there, you know, I would I could detail like a breakdown of what you would have to do. But if that was the shot for the movie, that's only that's the only shot that you're going to see is that one image right there. But if we were making a game or something revolving around that, you're really, you know, you're looking at it from a million different angles. And it's a lot trickier. So would you say one is more enjoyable than the other? No, I mean, it, it, it's so different because film is really enjoyable because it's more connected to the way an artist thinks is the shot. So you're thinking of composition in the same way you do when you're doing a painting, when you're taking a photograph, because that's sort of what it is, unless the shot actually takes you on a journey, through, like a single shot, like Children of Men, where it's like an over shoulder cam and is running through the city and you're doing a whole like sequence generally it is like more like connected to like doing a concept image or, or a, uh, a photograph. However, the game aspect of it makes it more immersive because you're in it and you walk around and you get the music, like exploring a big world, like, you know, like a uh, ghost of Tsushima or, or, uh, um, you know, something like the last of us or, or God of war. Like you really feel like I'm going to stop for a second. I'm going to pause and I'm going to let the clouds roll over the mountain and just like sit and look for a minute because I want to, because I'm stopping now. And that is a different experience because the pacing is a little bit more up to you, how you want, at least in the kind of games that I like to play. Um, that would be more of that experience versus um, the movie is what it is and you're passive. Um, so there's a big pros and, you know, to each side. I've definitely, I've spent since 2004, I've worked in games full time since then. So I've always worked full time, um, but I've I've only just done little stints in film and TV. So I've never been like that's my whole life. So I can't speak yeah. on it the way you know someone that has okay. done only that. But well, I would say uh, since leaving film and going to the games, the coolest thing is that like exactly what you just said. I can stop and look at my piece in film. It's on there for two seconds, maybe even less, <laughs> or it's blurred out. You don't even know what the final product is. Where in the game, you know exactly what it's going to look like, and you can actually sit and take it in. So yep. that's that's something I really enjoy about it. Exactly. Uh, so let's talk about, let's check out the, the Naughty Dog, um, this piece. This is cool. So what what is the the process when you're doing this? Like, how do they come to you with a problem, then you have to figure it out? Like, what's, what is it usually? How's it mm -hmm. go? Oh, they're always different, but in a lot of cases in games, you know, you get a very basic block mesh. You either start by the concept artist is defining the idea, like you're you're presenting the idea, and then they will start blocking out a space in 3D based on your idea, or the the original idea comes from what the the block, you know, the 3D was. Like that's the space that we actually need because the gameplay has to be A B C D. So that's what we need to make. But it's gray box. It's very very blocky cubes most of the time you know very very basic me uh mesh as they say for people who aren't um, involved in 3d the mesh is just like the wireframe of what the geometry is and it will be very very blocky there's nothing there and so then you'll get that and then you'll realize like okay so we have this 
sloping triangular kind of hillside. We're in sort of a canyon where we're, we're going to be following this river and we're going to be walking along the shores of this river. And we can't really climb up to those big hillsides. So everything up above like, you know, a couple meters is going to be just art, cool periphery. But what we really need is this little ravine where we walk along this river that let's just say that's what the idea is. So in this shot, like that's all I had. So I didn't use any of that. I, I built my own 3D scene. So this is 90%. I mean, I, I think you could say 90% 3D actually. Um, a lot of oh, mega scans really? okay. assets. Yeah, the rocks, the, cool. the leaves, like all those, those hillsides are made up of kind of like me mashing together um, some mega scans things to get the layering of these huge kind of triangular wedge shaped boulders. If you really look closely, you can see some of the repeated uh, 3D assets, but then I go over the top with photos and and blend out those those things so that you can't see it as easily. The trees as well, you know, if you you have some nice mega scans tree stumps, but then the rest of the tree may not be there. So I'm getting it to be where it connects to the ground. That's the the money. That's what I'm looking for. And then the rest of it, I can photo uh, photo bash kind of the all the foliage, which is going to look way better than any 3D foliage. Photos just I still don't think that 3D foliage can ever compete with a good, well exposed photograph. That's my opinion. But um, so I like to hybridize the the style of the look. It's all it's always like a hybrid. Um, if if there were 3D trees that in that that work for that particular shot, then I would just usually start with that and see where it goes. But that's the process for this one. Yeah. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, like what you were comparing back to back in the day where you had to draw everything with all the new techniques using 3D um, and photos, it exponentially probably speeds up the process, wouldn't you say? A hundred percent. Yeah. And and it's it's a great, um, I, I really like it as a, as a, um, as a way to skip past the not, you mentioned this before about about AI, but it's a great way to skip past some of the not so fun part of exactly. the old two D way. So like I I can figure a lot of things out and experiment more. Which if there's a tool that gives you the ability to experiment more, I'm always in favor of that. So so that's the benefit is to be able to experiment more, figure things out, and then get yourself to the fun part as quickly as possible. Which is yeah, that's what I like. So here's a contrast. This piece uses zero 3D. This is 100% photos and painting. So it just depends on what you're able to get, what the piece requires, what at, what things you have to start with. Um, you know, in this case, I didn't need 3D because I had a good plate uh, or a, several different three or four different plates that I started with to build the scene. And then I knew like, ah, oh, well, I've, I've got it. That's all I need to do is kind of add the third read stuff on top. So I didn't need it at, for this one. Were these all your photos? Um, some. So I spent a long time in Lake Arrowhead um, as a kid, and I still do go up pretty often in the winter. And so I get some really nice snowy tree photos for myself yeah. and ground snowy ground in this kind of ambient lighting. So I have, it's hard for me to say, to be honest, I don't remember, but I've got a ton of this stuff of my own. And, um, at naughty dog, we had a big thing of, of always sharing our assets, having, having, um, on the server, having a, a shared folder where we would all drop our alphas. I, I save every alpha that I ever cut out. So I, fr from 2004 on, I have like all these tree alphas that I've cut out and saved on That'd my own nice pack. <laughs> it's not bad. It's not bad. And then yeah. you compound that with Atons and Johns and Maches. And, and we all have our own stuff that like our best of the best that we would drop in there. So we would have a, a good library to, to choose from as well. So what would you say um, technique wise, like to make it a cohesive image where all the colors are in the right range, bright values and everything. So um, is there any little trick you use, like saying levels or any... Or do you just, you know, just using your eye, basically? Um, it, it varies. I mean, you know, I use all the various different adjustment tools. One, okay, the, the the one thing I will say is that I I think it's important to establish that that squintable read very early, so you kind of uh -huh. know what you're going for. And so, any of the curves or like the LUT, so to speak, the um the post the post is is just that. You're not like getting that mixed in like to the to the hamburger patty in the middle you you want that to be like i want to get as close as i can without that and then i want to apply that at the end to get you just that last little bit of the way there um 
other than that, honestly, it just depends. Like you want to find photos that are exposed correctly so that they are already close to, you don't have to get them far. You have to, they're already, they already look great. You know, this is yeah. kind of Revenant esque in terms of its, um, color grading, you know, not too far off that where the, the blacks go, go a little bit colorful, like, and they're the, the overall kind of tone is this kind of cool bluish green, but that's sort of, that's sort of the, uh, long and short of it on this one. This is one of the simpler ones. There's not really that much to say in yeah. terms of any tricks. Well, I would say that, uh, I feel a lot of people starting up will just grab like to say, uh, a thousand images and try to put it together where in if you ask any pro they're like well you know what sometimes i just use one image <laughs> you know you find that one image two images three images that just uh, gets most of the work done and they're in the same lighting and everything and just speeds up the time you're not always struggling or fighting it fighting the image you know the more just, photos you use the more behind you're going to be the harder it's going to be the, the the less photos you use the more ahead the better shape you're going to be in that's the general that's how I feel anyways. No, I agree. Uh, it definitely, definitely helps with um, that painting. Uh, Another cool. f like very 3D heavy scene, mostly 3D, I would say. Um, were the buildings, were, did you model the buildings or were they yeah, assets so the, already given? No, they were, um, there were, so I grabbed some bits of the, like the block mesh for the what the buildings were in the game, but then you know they're not textured, they're not finished, so you, you end up going in and modeling a lot on top. Anyways, the burn buildings as well. Um, the car on the left was an in-game car with. Um, I may have done a substance for the textures for something close to camera like that. I don't remember. Um, and then the characters are, are you know our in-game characters, and I we would render those out with like obviously alphas and the normals so that you can adjust the lighting on them a little bit better and, and do stuff like that. Um, using uh, planes with emissive textures, creating the fire in octane. So it would give a nice reflection on the, the materials on the ground. Um, yeah. So I started just like instancing those and duplicating those in the background. So those characters with fires in the background, those are like 2d planes with an alpha with an emissive texture. So it's kind of like little fiery shapes glowing and then, once that's in the render, you can kind of copy and paste and adjust those and add some screen layers that layer more fire on top of them. Um, yeah. So the, the cool fire you're saying is a card, not an actual VDB. Correct. Yeah. Okay. A lot of them, cause it's far, far enough away that, um, the card works just fine. Like the, the, I, I want to say you render the fire or was this a photo of fire? No, that, so it's both. They they were in the 3D scene as cards, planes. So you you can see like the the ground texture, like the material on the ground is reflecting that fire. So it's in the the 3D scene to begin with um, as a 2D plane with an alpha of the fi a, a, a black and white fire alpha, then giving it an emissive, you know, a glowing cool. fire yeah. photo with an emissive texture. So it, it actually does have a glow effect to it. And then to, to really refine it, you can put screen layers of, of once you're in Photoshop, you can put screen layers of fire on top of it to give it that beautiful yeah. little extra, you know, something yeah. like that. That's great. How much time do you get for something like this to work on? Honestly, they vary quite a bit, but uh, you'd like a few days, <clears throat> three, four days would be ideal. Um, depends on feedback. Sometimes like, you know, working with our, our team and John, like John would be very, he's very, uh, like we all kind of would take ownership over our area and we would just like flesh it out to the highest level that we can. And he would, you know, come by and say, give some, some two cents on various different things, but it would be, it would kind of just be as long as it took to get it to the level that we we're looking for so that there's no question like this is the end all be all like when we go back and we look at what the, we want the level to be like we should be able to point to our concepts and and not have any questions not answered i guess is kind of the way we we preferred to do it cool so jumping back to the the normals you said for real lighting so are you is that's just because you're still trying to figure out the lighting of the scene or instead of using an actual like to say an area light or uh pointing this way to uh, light it over here. Like how, how are you using it really? Like 
what did I you, meant was let's just let's just like go onto this horse and this these characters right here. Did you have a light hitting them right here, or was it lit differently and then you used a normal to kind of relight it? No, so just so to explain, actually, these characters I did not grab them in 3D and put them in the 3D scene. These are characters that were grabbed from in game in 2D. So oh, I, okay. I took screenshots of them and rent from the engine and rendered out uh, alphas and rendered out their um, their normals from the actual from in game, so that then okay. I could photo bash them into the shot. And relight them using the normal pass, essentially, oh, because okay. I you so we could it, we do have the ability to grab the characters from the game and export their textures, export like get them set up in Maya, export their textures, export the all everything, and and Robbie did that very well. I just found that the amount of time it would take for you to do that, I it, for all these characters and all these poses, I'm like I'm absolutely not doing that. I'm going to play the level. They're in a good spot. They look pretty good already. Maybe they're from a different level. Maybe those are on the right. Those are scars on the left. They're militia. And you're riding through a firefight between these two sides, like shooting back and forth. And you're riding through the burning, you know, scar village, essentially, I believe. Um, and so you got militia on the left scars on the right. I, I just pulled them for wherever I could get them from. And I'm, I know I'm going to photo bash them in. I'm, there's no chance I'm, I'm going to be rendering out those. I'm going to be, uh, compiling those 3d all those 3d models if it's just ellie walking through with a gun in a dark environment like a lot of our you know then yes yeah. we have an ellie an ellie that's posable and got the textures and all that because it's just one it's one thing yeah. right well on top of that you also have the high res geo that you have to then low res yourself and that's just a waste of time so it's definitely a smart move i like this it would be great like to have you back on and actually demonstrate that technique <laughs> Yeah, I'd like it's, to actually utilize it in my own. <laughs> it's well, I won't have the uh, the engine, the game running. That would it would have to be able to True. see the the way. It's essentially if you took a screenshot of a render that was incomplete, and but you, you didn't have a perfect render, but you had the normals exported so that you could yeah. adjust the light and shadow values to your liking, and then at least have that to start with. I mean, that's pretty damn good start, I think. Yeah. Well, in any uh, render engine, you can get the normals out of them anyway. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah it's cool so this i'm assuming it's all painted maybe with some photos underneath no just painted um it was just like painted. yeah it was a study i think it it was based on maybe uh i don't know maybe clyde aspfig if i had to guess or scott christensen i don't know which one of them but it was like a study a color study and then i kind of changed it started out as a study and then i changed a bunch of stuff and i kind of made made it into my own thing but it was just like i was just trying to absorb the way those they paint snow in a very specific way that makes it feel very luminous and colorful actually when it's we think of it oh snow's white well they don't paint it that way they paint it very colorful and reflective of the environment yeah. so that's all this was is um that just a painting exercise what'd you learn from this like exactly like what was your what was your your mental or my, your 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 thought behind everything like you have some purples in here but then you have some highlights and then the, the cools down here um like what were you? What were you thinking when you're? I mean, those? I get mostly. I get like alternative ways of thinking about color that they're very flashy with, and they are, take a lot of really cool chances and risks that only someone of their level, their caliber of you know of painter and their level of experience would would probably be able to do so seemingly easily. And they do it like on every painting. It's a whole different thing, yeah. and and so learning about how they render form and how they uh, indicate things simply. So how I got a lot better at my indicating of, of um, bushes, trees, mountains, all these things, like being able to paint stuff loosely and, and quickly and effectively is something that I feel like I've learned a lot from all the landscape painters that I, that I really follow. I remember uh, when you were teaching me, you were a huge fan of the lasso tool. Are you still a huge fan of the lasso tool? Not as much as I probably was then. It's cool. Okay. It's it's cool for teaching students. I mean, because the way because it forces students to think about shape, so it encloses a shape. So yeah, I, no, I for sure use it a lot. But it's not like there was an era of like lasso tool painting, <laughs> which is like <laughs> yeah. everything is very shapey, and it's cool yeah. because it forces you to think about shape. So I still do absolutely use it. And if I were to demo. I would probably uh, demo with it, but it's not as much of a, you know, a staple as it was maybe back then. So maybe 50, 50. <laughs> you say, say what? So maybe 50, 50. Yeah, exactly. I think that's fair. 
Yeah. Uh, let's go to the other page. I was looking sick, but let's move on. Uh, do you have, uh, how's the time for you looking? That's good. Okay. So let's see. There's some uncharted stuff. Let's check this out. Mm hmm. So I'm assuming, let me guess 3D <laughs> um, and photos, maybe 3D mm -hmm. here, uh, photo, and yeah. So maybe, mostly just uh, mid ground is all 3D with photos on top. Am I correct? Yeah, the the Ganesha giant elephant was a uh, was a sculpt, and then um, everything else is photo. Cool. What was the so what was the the pitch for this one? Do you remember? Yeah, this was the first concept I did for Uncharted: Lost Legacy, and it was so sick because they didn't they actually just followed this concept and made, blocked out the the level. There ended up being multiple. There was a couple things. There ended up being multiple Ganeshas. I would have liked for it to just be one because it didn't make, to me, it didn't make sense that there were multiples because there is only one in the mythology. Um, but they did make it just like this. It was like a, the top ledge of the waterfall spilling over the side and, and it, you know, holding the, the hand and it, there was all very, um, you know, even like the, the, the hand pose holding the ax, like there's a lot of really cool details and things that they, you know, they captured pretty well. And you end up climbing on the, you know, trying to enter the, a secret entrance, like somewhere behind the head or something like that, if I remember correctly, but you have to kind of swing from branch to branch to get across it, something to that effect. But what I was trying to accomplish here is to show how can we make something feel gigantic, you know, that waterfalls are flowing over it and trees and flowers are growing on it. And it's been abandoned there for, you know, a thousand years, however long, hundreds of years. Um, that was, that was the goal. And did they provide you with reference images of like, Hey, we want something to look kind of like this or like how much freedom did you have? hundred percent. I, I designed it. It was just what I came up oh, with. Cool. I mean, th there are, so just to be fair, there are, um, this is a very, uh, traditional view of Ganesha. This is, so I, I research lots of sculptures and lots of, um, different, um, ways that Ganesha is shown. And we were tried to be very authentic in the way we approached this one, especially, you know, going deep into Hinduism and, and it's, we wanted, it's such a beautiful faith and, and, um, it's so spiritual and there's just things about it that we wanted to capture as authentically as possible. So we did that and tried to do that as best we could. And, um, and so I did lots of research going into, you know, all, everything I did for this game. Cool. What I really like a lot is this area because you have, you know, the fog and then hard edges of the trees and then, you know, the soft to hard and everything. It's just, it's a nice mixture of the two. It feels very organic and natural, but yet mm -hmm. epic at the same time. Yeah, we, we ended up doing our a lot. The concept team did a lot of the actual um, effects uh, fog for the for the final game. We, we placed quite a lot of uh, fog emitters to create those kind of effects where in these mountains, you know, we wanted the idea of like layers of clouds nestling their way into these these ravines as they go back. All right. So we got caught out due to the Internet and we're back on. Let me go back to sharing the screen. All right. See my screen? Yep. All right, so back out. Well, sorry, where'd you leave off? <laughs> um, you were talking. We were, we were talking about um the putting VFX clouds into the into the game into the sky. The concept team would place those. You know, we kind of the the uh, effects department would set up the emitters, and then we would or the spawners as as I believe they they were called, and we would uh, we would go in the engine and and place them in the actual level. So it was kind of cool to be able to try to recreate the 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 way we did it in the concepts in the oh, first place just, that's cool so you're saying that uh they gave you like these trees were they 3d what you're saying and that you had particles of smoke going across no i meant in the actual game oh in the actual game okay so they were yeah. recreating this you're yeah. saying okay, we're okay. trying to get that same effect the way that we used the fog it was kind of the art direction that we were sort of um that we were sort of setting up so it was like we could actually affect that in the final game because we were making the we were using the the fog ourselves. Okay, cool. Is there any image that you would say was the most stressful or most you felt most insecure with, um, and that you had to just like really just you know buckle down and figure out and then grow from it kind of thing? Yeah. Um, any of those really gnarly sci-fi ones from other pages, I don't know, nothing on this page. The Last of Us stuff is pretty straightforward. Like, it's not really that, 
it's just takes time. There's not really that um, stressful, but the ones that the sci-fi ones were, you know, like that one on the left, that, that this one? was a lot. It may not look like it, but it was so much work to get all of the things um, working, you know, using multiple tools, uh, using 3D coat. A lot of it was sculpted in 3D coat, actually. Um, getting the, getting decimating things down the right amount so it looked good. Um, then, you know, Octane rendering this kind of, I this feeling of, in the bottom, I wanted it to almost feel like fish underwater like the way that look was is like they're space explorers right but i wanted them to feel like they're kind of scraping the 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 lower atmosphere of a of a planet and you're in these series of planets and they're sort of close by to this giant unicron-esque you know thing uh this planetoid thing in the background so it was just like this it was like a composition within a composite like it's it, it was just a lot of it was a very ambitious piece with a lot of shit going on sculpted the the smaller ships a couple different versions of those sculpted the larger ships sculpted the planetoid thing and then got the rendering right so i got the right you know when you're using volumetric you know fog and octane you're using scattering there's there are ways to affect the color with your fog like the actual color of the yeah. light the color of the fog the color of the scattering the transmission yeah. the various different combinations of these different elements so i did so many render tests to get just the right thing going uh to make it feel like this throwback sci-fi piece with this very colorful palette again pink like this planetoid thing is pink when i look at that i'm like why the hell did i choose pink i don't know why i did that but i love it i like the way that looks but it was stressful to making those decisions it just took me a lot of iterations to get there was it uh, a personal piece or was it for something yeah it was um it was so it was part of a it was part of a, a piece that i did for learn squared um for a workshop I did for them. I had already started it. So I had already kind of like the process had the process going, but then I kind of like realized, Oh, this is a cool technique to teach people to be able to use. Like, I'm not really using much blender. A, a there was a little bit, but it was predominantly sculpting in 3d coat and then rendering in octane. Cause you know, that it's great for volumetrics. It's got, you know, the volumetric fog thing. It's got, um, you can bring VDBs into it. It's it handles super heavy meshes, which these most certainly are. And you instance it multiple times in a scene, and now you've got a scene that's twenty million, thirty million. I don't even know what the actual poly count would have been, but um, Blender would have had a, a with materials, you know, emissives on all of them. Like Blender would have had a, a a field day with that scene if it was trying to do that so it was just like leveraging the gpu heavy render in octane and and then the fun of sculpting hard surface stuff in 3d coat which i think is really fun cool so you basically scattered a bunch of these uh 3d ships around right yeah so you'd have like multiple of those those big ones it's the same one but i yeah. i did that because i i love the upshot showing how it's like looking underneath it because I, I love that shape but then i was like yeah but then you don't get to see the silhouette very much so then yeah. i was like let's have an armada because i have a series of our uh, it's called armada like it's several different versions of that where it's all about this like space exploration sort of theme and um I was like, well, let's just go with the theme. Let's have multiple of them. Like that, those are the motherships, and then the little ones are like scout ships, the little guppy-looking ones, the fish-looking things. Those are like the smaller scout ships, and the big ones are the the more like the mother fleet, so the star destroyers, so to speak, to use Star Wars terms. Um, and so that's well, why. I, you... Sorry, go on. No, no, no. That's why I had I, I decided to have multiples, so you could see that from different angles like that. Cool. So, what made you actually want to push? so much 3d in this one so, like because you use a lot of 3d you saw photos but this one you decide to really push yourself and use such like you're using volumetrics like that's which is surprising um for because you, you probably know how to render out volumetrics just by painting it right so like what made you really want to go so heavy in 3d mm, you get there's some fun happy accidents that happen like so one thing i started sculpting the huge planet thing in 3d code i was like this is going to be sick i'm going to make i'm going to see how much of this i can just make um 
in 3d and and um i had an idea for that design i'm like i you know it's kind of the reason why i think it's pink is probably because of unicron it's very transformers 80s throwback kind of um uh inspired so i was like all right i'm gonna work on that and then i decided to combine that with the other mothership which was like a, a marker sketch on my you know on a on a post-it note and i was like that's an interesting silhouette i'm gonna try to i'm gonna try to actually model that in 3d code so i was sort of learning more advanced modeling techniques in 3d coat to make these really organic but still crisp hard surface forms and so that's what i started with and then obviously so now you're when you have stuff that's that heavy i i prefer i'm always going to try to render in in octane because it's gonna it's just going to handle that stuff super well so then you 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 know add volumetric fog because you get some really fun happy accidents whether you're using a projecting you're projecting the light scattering through it like it's like it's rays or, you know, my first render, this was very murky. Like this looked like the bottom of a lake where yeah. the bottom half of the, of the render, it was like very heavy. And then I, I, so I slowly started incorporating this, like the bottom part is the atmosphere of that planet. And then as we're going up the composition, it's lightening up and we're seeing out of the atmosphere into the rest of space where this top of this planet thing is like bl the lights blooming off of it. So I was like, I had this whole vision of like how it could feel. And um, the 3D helped me accomplish the, uh, the, the sorry, the, the volumetrics helped me accomplish the bottom part of that. And the top was just like, um, it was more just like more illustrative and more painty in the top part. Like the color was made up. That's a cool, it's a cool piece. Uh, would your, oh, where is There's X. Um, was there anything that just made you just want to quit being an artist? Because you know, like the hours is grueling, painting maybe the same subject matter over and over again. Like, were there any kind of moments in your career where it was just like, fuck this? Yeah, but of course. Um, it's not the actual art part. It was the, I mean, the crunch at Naughty Dog is pretty, is pretty brutal. Um, it, it, at the time, it was very, it was rough. And it just depends on what your role is and how much you personally invest into the, those moments. And, um, yeah, it was it was a savage uh, lifestyle for a while there. Just trying to, you know, it's a hard thing because you could say, well, Aaron, why didn't you just stop? Well, I'll tell you why. Because people that are that really have a vision and really want to like exert themselves, you know, and really want to do something important and really want to um, really want to push the pace and and try to really accomplish something and and really help the team. You know, it's not when you're working in a studio, you're, tr you're working for the team. It's you never put yourself above the team. You should always put the, you know, the team is what we're, we're all part of. And so just little by little, like that kind of eroding, you know, your spirit away doing that for long enough. I mean, eventually it never makes me want to quit being an artist. It just makes mm -hmm. me realize like we're live. this is an unsustainable situation. Yeah. And that's kind of, yeah, everyone hits that at some point, you know, I feel like, and you have to, it's healthy to learn that so that you know, no, it's not, I don't want to say that. It's not healthy to go through that. It certainly is not mentally nor physically. But if you do find yourself going through that, I feel like there's a lesson to be learned where you know, okay, let's figure out how to manage ourselves um, a little bit, uh, manage the expectations, manage the hours, manage the, um, you know, everything uh, from that point on. So that's sort of where I feel like there, there is, I had to look for a silver lining in that regard. Well, was there anything in there that kind of helped you stay mentally fresh, like working out or getting the good sleep or just 100%. try to do a uh, side projects on the, on the side or, or, or you just too burned out probably to do No, that? everything above uh, all the above, except the sleep part, not, not doing enough of that. But, um, I, I was, say, as we get older, it is fucking hard to get a good sleep. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's true. Um, but no, I, I was working out very, very, uh, rigorously, very frequently. I was, um, at the time of going through that particular crunch, I had been, I had spent several years going back into martial arts. So I had been doing a lot of sparring and doing a lot of training in, in Muay Thai with some, some great martial artists that I knew from lifting at the gym. So I got back into it with them and, hey. you know, we'd be go, go over there for two hours and try to kill each other in the sparring room. And that, you know, it opened up like I did this a lot when I was a kid, I had done a lot of years of martial arts. So it kind of opened up this like child inside of me of like, of 
being able to let out, you know, you just really, if you never experienced that and sparred with someone, it's different than like playing basketball or playing baseball or running, sprinting uphill because your body's releasing adrenaline um, in that fight or flight sort of way, even though you know you're safe. These are your friends. You're not trying to actually yeah. hurt each other. But um, it when you're done, you're just done. You're just like so at peace because you don't have any left. You just, you're, your glycogen is torched. You have nothing left in your body. You sweat out all the sodium and you have your adrenaline gland is taxed. You're just, it's over. So the feeling after like a good hour kickboxing workout and then sparring however many rounds is just, there's nothing like it. So I, I feel like it did help me a lot carry through and feel, feel as healthy as I could um, physically to combat the mental, um, you know, the very difficult mental health uh, yeah. of going through that sort of a thing. I've always ate very clean. So my diet was yeah. good and, um, that sort of stuff. I'm, I was very regimented about at the time, which I'm grateful for. Um, but there's no way around it. Ultimately, even that stuff doesn't save you. It just makes it better for sure. Yeah. I don't understand how so many people in the VFX industry just, they're out of shape. And like I've seen, I've had, people sitting next to me with a 24 pack of red bull i'm like how how are you functioning like if i'm just a little bit off if i've had some bad sleep or i haven't been working out for a while i just it's just a bad day <laughs> like i can't function like it's just you don't feel as sharp and fresh in the mind um and i also think that the discipline that you're talking about with the adrenalers like i always felt like um nothing could compare like, you know, if you pull a full night, you know, a full week, just all nighters, just, just cranking out, working, busting your ass off on, on a project, it won't, at least I'm not throwing up, right? Because that's what would happen when I was training tennis back in the day. I was just like, eh, that's like, I'm physically getting hurt. Here, I'm not so much mentally tired or whatever, but I'm not going to die. Yeah. So I, yep. I think it's just, it's a different mentality if you actually incorporate sports into your life. And I really do recommend um, artists to really start getting more physically active. This will just be happier all the sitting down you know it's just it's brutal that's what it kills me is being in a house or studio with no sunlight right you can't get that vitamin d and you're just like this isn't normal like your our human body is not supposed to be like this at all yeah um so being able to get outside and be active physically healthy is just so important just i do a lot of gardening a lot of yard work outside i know it sounds silly yeah. but i feel like no, being I one with too. nature digging in the dirt, digging holes, like dig, just d being out and doing things with your hands without technology and cutting, trim, pruning flowers, fertilizing, like all the things that involve are involving landscaping and gardening. I feel like it's really invigorating and just hear the birds and just like early in the morning. It's, it's just like, I know it sounds stupid. I sound no, like an old, old lady or something, but I, it's so good. I feel so good when I do it. No, it's exactly what I've said to my wife. Like, because I have this garden bed and I was like, you know, it's so it's such a good start to the day. I get my tea, I go out, start watering the plants, see how they're doing, and it's just like it's a great day. And it's yep. just you being in touch with nature, right? That's why I left the cities. Like, uh, he's working from home, which is a life changing, right? It's you can go where you want to live. And I just I got sick of being in the city, so I, I moved down to Tennessee. I'm just way more with, with nature, and it's just more. Peaceful. Where Where are you in Tennessee? I'm in, I'm close to Nashville. I'm in uh, Murfreesboro right now. Such a beautiful um, place, man. Oh, it is. Yeah. Uh, we want to get, I'm, I'm waiting for everything to crash. So we, we, so I can get some country land and, uh, and live over there, be with the, even more trees and, and stuff. Now, out in, um, I'm not in the Knoxville area. I'm in the central part of Tennessee. So the mountains are more in the Knoxville area, but yeah, it's it's pretty. It's nice. The weather, four seasons. That was a weird thing about LA was that you had one season the whole time. <laughs> and it, just, <laughs> it kind of messes with your mind. Like you can't appreciate the different holidays, the seasons, the smell in the air, right? So yeah. Now, and then and then I moved to Canada, and that was like eighty percent winter, dark mm -hmm. circles in the eye, pale as a ghost. I'm dying. <laughs> I'm like I gotta get out of here. I'm just <laughs> done with this. Moved to I Tennessee, four seasons. I I grew up in Virginia, right? So it was four seasons too. It's this very similar kind of type of weather. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really helped me out a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for the work from home. Are you working from home now? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's cool. For three How years now. Him? Um, it would be, uh, I like a lot of things about it. Number one, it's a lot less time commuting, going over to the studio in Santa Monica that I was, you know, at Naughty Dog working there. I live in Sherman Oaks. So that's like a little bit of a drive. It's not bad. It's a nice drive in the canyons. 
And if you enjoy driving, got a comfy car, whatever the situation is, it's, it's kind of, it's a, it's kind of like a mental break, I guess you could say, or it could actually be, you could end up being super pissed off by the time you get to work. Depends on how your drive goes. But, um, so you're skipping that, skipping the commute, less gas, less driving, all that. Um, but honestly, the biggest thing for me is we had a baby in, um, fall of 2020. And so, oh, thank you. If, uh, if I hadn't had that, I mean, that is the real blessing, um, because we were able to, I was able to be here for every second of his life, which is, would never have been possible in the normal world where I'd be, I'd only see him for a second in the morning and I'd, I'd be home and he'd be asleep already every single day. So that's, you know, that's, I have to be grateful for, for sure. Yeah. I do miss some of the camaraderie, you know, um, yeah. The collaboration actual being like it's fun doing with the video, but it's not the same as like person to person. But I still wouldn't go back. This is just it's life is just so much the the balance is so much better. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So do you have a, enough time to check out some community work or give some advice or feedback or anything? Um, I don't have much more time to be honest. I got a I got something an, an, another thing I had committed to that I got to jump out for at seven. I don't know how much more time I have for a, another chapter, uh, unfortunately. But I'd be happy oh, to do it do, another time. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, let's just finish off with just this image um, and call it a, a night and talk about this. I I loved Uncharted Four, and I always liked the design of this melon over here. What was the deal with this? I was always wondering about it. Were you just trying to make something scary and 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 monster like? What what was the process? Um, so I did a, I did a, uh, we did a series of bl- of black and white sketches uh, for just blue skying, like how we could, or just kind of like thinking about what some of these um, Libertalia it wasn't called that at the time, but what some of these island environments would look like. And so we just had, you know, there were so many cool ideas that came about, but one of them, I had, um, this lightning storm out in the ocean and in one of the, and I had the, like the lightning flashing and you could see the silhouette with like being rimlet, like this one huge rock that was out there. And Rob Rupel at the time worked there said, that's weird. That looks like a snapping turtle kind of that rock. Cause I just made a shape. It wasn't meant to be like this face. It was just a cool shape. Okay. And then, so once he said that, he's like, why don't you just like make it subtle, like this creepy rotting looking snapping turtle face. So, um, Bruce, the Bruce Straley, the, the director liked that idea. And then, so from then on, I sort of like, every time I would do this rock, uh, when, every time I would show this, I kind of like pushed it into that, you know, the, the way that in Thailand, the, the stalactites are like coming down from the, you know, from the, the, the overhangs of the rock, I sort of incorporated that geological look but with this you know one of the caves like was the eye like collapsing in but even like the face there's like a fissure splitting the face down in the middle so one side is lower than the other so it gives it this feeling of this massiveness to it um but that was it that was what started it is uh rob noticing something in one of my early sketches and then i and then it turned into that <laughs> see i love that kind of story where it's just like hey it looks like this let's just go with it and you just push it towards that direction instead of someone coming to you and be like, I want it exactly like this is then you get to be more creative and you just discover something you probably would have never thought of anyway. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was a cool, it's a very me idea. Like it's something I would have liked. It was, I'm glad he, that he found, saw that and thought of it because it's something <laughs> I would have liked to do. Like, let's do something very subtle and iconic and incorporate that into the environment. It's a very me thing. Thing, like thing that I would love doing. So it was like, oh, that's a great, yeah, let's absolutely. And, and, and as time went on, it was like, how can we make it feel bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where, you know, in the game it was, and you know, we did the same thing. You can see the little, the clouds nestled into the tree line. Like we did the same thing. We put the fog in the final, in the game, like in the, with, with the VDB, you know, you know the, um, the spawners yeah. as they called them to cool. really make it feel like layers and layers and layers of canopy going back. And it was, you know, if we made it feel pretty big, I think in the final game. Do you ever get a chance to do the sky boxes? Um, yeah, since you've already yeah, cool. I did in in Lost Legacy. I did a few of them. I actually am a big uh, advocate for that because you have so much control. Like you can do things if you have control over the sky box and the clouds, the atmospheric clouds. Then you can work with the environment artist to do that next layer of actual geo background so you can work them together so that you're tuning it just right you have the geo mountains or whatever that distant 
element of geometry is almost to the skybox. Then you've got you've got some some movable VFX cloud layer to play with, whether it's in yeah. front, behind, both. And then you've got the skybox, which you can then tune the values of the sky so that it's just perfect. Yep. And you get this beautiful transition. That's the way we we started to get really good at that towards the end of my time there. Um, Last of Us 2, I did a lot of that. And I did so, uh, quite a lot of that VFX sky slash putting in smoke in the burning scar village thing. I did like a lot of those wides um, with the VFX, the VFX department helped me obviously get set up, but I did a lot of the tuning and placing and, and, um, arranging of those. And then creating that transition into the sky is, uh, I think something a lot of, a lot of concept artists could, could do more of, to be honest. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, um, a VFX workflow where you're painting something that's photorealistic because any, you know, CG or, um, game element in the foreground would look low, low res but when you push it back in the distance you have no clue how low res that is right so it mm -hmm. sells like you can make it super photo real looking uh, mm -hmm. while having the game uh playable area uh low res so it, it all works seamlessly and with the in film you'd have the plate right so you'd have the um either a cg render in the foreground or the plate with the video footage and then you have the the painting in the back and you just have to match the two uh, I just I think games can really push that more and um, give that more cinematic feel because I feel like a lot of game studios are just like just make everything 3D just you know um, don't use some of those hacks but cool. yeah I think there's a good balance for there's sure there's definitely a good balance um, so sweet man this has um, been a great talk I know you have to run um, and yeah if you want to come on and talk about the, some of the so basically, what if you don't know, I mean, I'll just run through it real quick. Uh, the community section is all the non-senior work and also senior whips. So the homepage is where you get all the at most senior approved. That's why um, when you were locking in, you're waiting for that approval, which I'm probably going to change that a little bit. But mm -hmm. um, so this will be all just senior quality stuff, right? You, you'll know it's professional. You can use this reference and guides and everything and just be inspired by um, and then, um, and you as an Atmos senior can also upload anything you want since we completely trust your eye. Uh, you can upload photos, traditional, uh, paintings, classicals and stuff. Uh, and then, uh, with the community, it's, uh, organized by a you know, student, junior, mid and, and, and everything like that. So, so yeah, it's organized. Um, we can maybe come back another time. You can check out this work. Um, we can talk about other things uh and yeah it's been great chatting with you man it's been great catching up with you um, yeah it's been forever yeah i'd be happy to come on another time and and do it do a separate one that's more focused on community um and and all that because it's, it's great it looks like a nice it's a nice viewing um uh viewing platform and and it the way it's it's different than i think anything any of the other platforms that we all use so i think it's definitely cool Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I just built it just because uh, I got tired of ArtStation, honestly. <laughs> it's like, it's too much and there's nothing environment related, especially for VFX. You don't see any of the photo real stuff. Um, and, or at least it was always so hard to find good map paintings because everything gets uh, pushed with um, characters and creatures and, and concept over there. Yep. But, yep. Um, so this is currently, it's environment organized and everything. And then I'll maybe, uh, I, I will, I plan on expanding it to, um, characters and creatures but still organized where you just tick a box and it just changes everything just to organize that they're not going to merge together like it is an art station and everything hmm. i think that's so, cool. cool thanks man um this was fun and go uh put your kid to sleep if that's <laughs> yep i'm glad that you have a kid that's fun you have a family it's been a long time so we've all yeah grown. it has <laughs> lots happened it's 10 years yeah. you know 10 more than 10 years probably 12 years and it feels like yesterday yeah i know it's wild yep. huh? all right man yep well thanks man i appreciate you coming on of course thank you and um yeah good luck with everything and uh hit me up uh sometime soon we'll uh, we'll do it again yeah for sure all right bye bye all right cheers yep.